hey, I'm the one. I'm the one that digs the old outhouses. Um, I, I don't recognize many people except Polly here. We've been doing public dig over in uh, Clarkston, and I know we're going to do another one real soon. <clears throat> Today, uh, I brought a variety. Everything that you see here came out of the ground. You know, everything I dug. Um, I brought some different things so I could show you different types of bottles. Today we're going to learn how to date them. And I'm going to tell you how I start and how I, how I find the spots and dig them. First of all, we, uh, we go by maps and we look for the old homesteads and, um, according to the maps. And then we go door to door and try to get permission for the places. When we find a spot, we uh, use a metal rod. It's called a probe. And what we do is we walk the backyard and you have a hard pan across the bottom of the yard. It's usually like three feet. So you stick in the probe in and you'll hit three feet, three feet, three feet, and all of a sudden that probe will drop. <clears throat> Wherever the hard pan's been broken by man, it'll never come back. So that gives you a pretty good idea where it might be. Sometimes you can feel coal ash. Uh, sometimes you can feel wood ash. I've been doing it now for 36 years. I can tell you if I hit a rubber boot at three feet, you know, so pretty much I can tell what we're feeling. Sometimes you can feel how old the hole is from the top. Um, sometimes you can't, but a lot of times there's four or five outhouses in every yard because uh, they would just fill it up and drag it over and fill up another one. If there was a lot of people in the house, they would go through more. <clears throat> There's actually been yards that we've dug nine and 10 privies in one yard. So it all depends on how many people and what was going on at the house at the time. When we dig the holes, you can tell a lot about the person that you're digging that the hole belonged to. Uh, I mean, like if you, if you dug 40 bottles, it was a cure for the throat and lungs. You know the guy probably had throat and lung problems. And if you dig one that has a, a bunch of inks in it, they were probably a writer or worked at the newspaper or something on that order. And if you dig one that's got 50 whiskey bottles in it, <laughs> you could pretty much tell what was going on in that action too. There's all, we dig all different kinds of things. Up here in these two cases, I have everything, clay pipes, marbles, doll heads. <clears throat> There's actually a real gun in there. When we find the spot, we lay tarps out and we'll cut the sod out like a puzzle and we move it onto a tarp and then we slide that right away. Then we lay tarps around the outside of the hole and more or less like a surgeon does when they're operating and everything goes up onto the tarps. When we get done, we just pick up the tarps and fill it in and then put the sod back on top and you can hardly tell we were there at all. Everybody always asks me how I got started. I was living up north and I was out hunting one day and I got back in the middle of the woods and I found an old dump back there. So I started pawing through the dump and I found some old blue mason jars and I was just totally fascinated with it. So I started going from farm to farm looking for these old dumps. After a while, I ran into another guy doing the same thing out there and his name was Bill and we started digging together. And we heard about them digging these outhouses, so we decided we were going to give it a try. So we got an old coat hanger, and we were running around with a coat hanger, poking it in the ground. We had no clue what we were doing. But I started up north where all the logging camps were, and it was all basically 1890 stuff. And we kept getting the same bottles over and over and over and over. So we started, I was a butcher, he was a butcher. We'd work 60 hours a week and on our day off, we started driving all the way down to Grand Rapids. And we would dig on our day off all day and then drive home and go back to work. But when you get down in the city, 
you get a lot older. Like here in Clarkston, you can get back into the 1830s pretty easy in some of the yards. Up there it was all 1890s, so I was, we were giddy, you know, getting, getting some of that older stuff down there. So then we started uh, hitting all the different towns. But what we did is we went around and did all the vacant lots on city properties. We would get permission through the city and try to hit all the city lots that there was no houses on. Well, in, in 1990, I was living up in Boyne. That's where I live now. And uh, I ended up moving downstate because my girlfriend had a custody battle with her boy. And so she ended up moving down. So I ended up moving down. And I, I just was tearing it up ever since then. I've dug everywhere from <clears throat> the Mackinac Bridge to Detroit. Um, I've dug in Grand Rapids, Niles. I've been all over, all over this state. We've dug next to the prison in Jackson. Um, I've just been everywhere. Now, one of the bottles that we always come up with <clears throat> Every town had these little drugstore bottles. These little drugstore bottles are just like if you get a plastic pill bottle from your doctors today. This is what they used back in the day. This one here is actually from Clarkston. This is one of the Clarkstons. It's Urchin Smith Druggist, Clarkston, Michigan. Now, in, in my 36 years, I have about 540 of these from over 350 cities in Michigan where I've been. Uh, I, they're not like a really expensive bottle. I mean, they're 10 bucks. Once in a while, they'll get up to 20, but I'm just fascinated with them. And some of them you like might recognize, like, does anybody remember the Cunningham Drug Store? This is a 1890s Cunningham Drug Store from Detroit. A lot of the bottles that you dig, some of them are still in existence today. You know, they still use them, like um, Bayer Aspirin. You know, we dig Bayer Aspirins back from the 1890s. Um, here's one. Does anybody recognize this? It's the bottle's still shaped like this today. Nope. Nope. Maggie seasoning? Anybody ever heard of that? Like kitchen bouquet type thing? This is a Maggie's from the 1890s. So a lot of the bottles made it through, through time and were, are still being used today. Now some of the bottles, in 1906, the Food and Drug Act came out and they had to start putting their ingredients down on the label. A lot of companies went out of business in 1906. There, there was one in Pacific it was called Radom's um, Fungus Destroyer. And there's a lot of them out there. I mean, they came in crockery, they came in glass bottles. They were very, very popular. In 1906, when the Food and Drug Act came out, they found out that it was 99% water, 1% red wine. <laughs> so they didn't last in business much longer than 1906. <clears throat> Well, first of all, let's, let me teach you on how to date a bottle. So if you have bottles at home and you want to figure out how to date the bottles, this will help you. From 1855 before, um, they used to make the bottles. They would blow the bottle into a glass mold. When the bottle was blown, then they would connect a glass rod to the bottom of the bottle. They would hold the glass rod and apply the top to it. When they were done, they would break the glass rod off. That left a sharp, round circle on the bottom. Now that's called a pommel scar. So they did that up in 1855 is when they started switching over from, from doing those. Now they also did, can everybody see the black dot on the bottom? This is another one from the 1855 and earlier. They would bre break the glass rod off the bottom and they would use an iron rod and they would smooth that out with the iron rod and the iron stuck on there. 
So this is called an iron pile. <coughs> so if you find them, you're, you're early stuff. That's, that's the stuff that we really like to dig the best. Has a lot more character. They're, they're just a lot prettier bottle. Then in the 1860s, they would, uh, they would blow the bottle in the mold. The top was still applied later. It's hard to see, but there's a line across, and then like a half a circle and a line across. That's called a key hinge mold. And if you look at it, you can see where they just stuck the top on. See how the glass is all drooping down, and they didn't like get fancy, they just plop, done. And this was in the 1860s to the 1870s. When we get in these yards and dig these privies, we can date these bottles within 10 years because the method of glass changed every 10 years in the United States. So we may have four pits dug and we can tell if we're missing like the 1870s era. We can tell if we're missing the 60s. So we keep trying in the yard till we find that one too. When we get done, we can say, yeah, they moved the outhouse from there, they went over there, then they put it back there, and then they had two of them up here in the front. So you can pretty much solve the yard and tell exactly where it was. <clears throat> in the 1880s, they were still applying the tops after it was made, but they would take and tool the top to where it was all smooth. There was no more glooping on. You could tell it's much more refined. It's more even. You can see thicker spots in the glass here than there is over here. They just started, they were moving along. They were progressing. But it's tooled and the bottle's not just stuck on. If you feel the inside of this one, you can feel the lip inside there to where it was just plopped on and it's like a separate piece altogether. So you can feel it right from the inside and see it from the outside. So in the 1890s, you could tell all the glass is much more even all the way around. <clears throat> around the edges here, there's little tiny dots. In these dots, they put vent marks. So when they were blowing into the mold, the glass would be more even because of the air coming out of the vent marks. It would fill the shoulders more even and everything was a lot more even. And that identifies it to the 1890s. In the 1900s, everything was pretty uniform and that's when we really start digging a lot of the same stuff. Now this one is from the 1890s. If you look here, there's a seam on the side. The seam stops right here and then it's smoothed off. So you can tell that the top was added on later because of the smoothness on the side. And then uh, in 1915, a guy named Owen invented the bottle machine. Now, when you get into the 1915 era, I mean, these bottles look a lot alike. But if you look at this one, the seam goes all the way to the very top. When you have that seam that goes all the way to the top, it's, in a, it's machine made. And so the whole bottle was made at one time in the machine and they didn't have to add nothing on. There's also a little ring around the bottom where it was punched out of the machine. So you can tell by the little ring on the bottom that it's machine made too. But the dead key is your seam all the way to the top. Any questions on dating? That pretty much tells you how to date. So you should be able to go home and say, yeah, this is 1890s, this is Everybody good with that? There's a quiz later. Yep. <laughs> I have a question about what were the tops made of? Were they glass as well? Oh yeah. 
So how did they get those off without breaking the bottle when they wanted to? Oh, you mean the the stoppers? Yeah. The stoppers were cork. They were all cork. Yeah, unless you have some of them are glass stoppers like this one. Okay, but it was a stopper type. Yeah, everything was cork. Screw tops didn't come around until some of your mason jars, 1890s. You know, some of, some of them were the 1880s, but bottles, they were like 1900 <clears throat> when they started doing that. All right, I'm going to show you a couple different kinds. See if we can guess. Freddie, you don't give it away. Anybody got any idea what that is? Still got stuff in it. For fire? Yeah, very good. Um, it's a fire extinguisher. It's actually dated, I think, 1886. 1883 and 1871. They used to throw them at the fire. There's a battle chemical inside, though, and it was real harmful for your lungs. So they weren't around for a long time, and they stopped doing them. Uh, I dug this one in Battle Creek. There was six of them broke in the hole, and this one was whole. And it's pretty rare to dig them whole. You know, it's still sealed and still has the chemical on the inside. So when you said they threw it at the fire, literally they threw the yeah. whole thing? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Something about that chemical would smother it. <clears throat> but it would also kill you. You know, so <laughs> it, it didn't last very long. <laughs> now, in the 1860s, uh, the government passed a tax on liquors. So a lot of these liquor <laughs> bottlers, they would take cherry bark or dandelion root or some kind of herb like that, and they would mix it with their liquor and they called it bitters. So it was sociably acceptable. You could go home and drink a half a bottle of bitters every night for what ails you, but if you drank a half a bottle of gin, they called you the town drunk. <laughs> bitters bottles are really cool because they come in a lot of different shapes. Uh, they come in fish, ear of corn. Um, there's just so many different kinds of bitters bottles. This is a bitters bottle. Uh, it's called Drake's Plantation Bitters, and it's supposed to represent a log cabin. Now this one is, it's dated 1862, but they were used up in, through the 1880s. They come in all kinds of colors. This is another one. This is a Langley's Root and Herb Bitters uh, from Boston, and this is 1860s too. You can tell the top's just slapped on. You know, and it's all rough on the inside. This is your very first Budweiser bottle. This is from the 1870s. It says original Budweiser on it, and it came out of Chicago. <clears throat> In the 1880s, this one says Anheuser-Busch and has the eagle on it, just like back in the day. So they've been using that symbol for a long, long time. I have one at home uh, called Lion Brewing. Has anybody ever heard of that? Do you remember the Stroh's bottles? They used to have a little lion on the label. The very first Stroh's bottle says the Lion Brewing on it uh, from Detroit. And I have one of them I dug in Milford, too. Here's one for you. Does anybody recognize this? This is, this is a cologne bottle, and it was blown at Sandwich, Massachusetts, at the Sandwich Glass Factory. It has a scar on the bottom. Uh, this is like 1840s, 1850s. These come in a lot of wild colors, too. Now, most of the time, you see I have a lot of the aqua-colored glass. <coughs> That's the normal color that from back in the day. They couldn't make clear. This was their clear. Uh, window pane, they would make glass with window pane that was clear, or dishes, but it was a lot more expensive. 
This is a cologne bottle here from like the 1880s, 1890s. I call it my genie bottle. It kind of looks like one of the, the genie head. We dig a lot of these. Usually we just dig one. That's why they threw them out. That's a salt and pepper shaker. And that's probably from the 1880s also. Any ideas on that? Yep, exactly. That's an old kerosene lamp. Some of the things you can't figure out why they threw them out. You know, I have um, pouring pitchers, teapots. My favorite cereal bowls dated 1877, and I you know that I use. I use quite a few of the dishes. I call it my privyware. <laughs> <laughs> Um, some of them will come out that clean. There's actually a method. I can take a bottle that come out of the ground that looks like this from the stain. And I can clean it into that. Now what we do, <clears throat> it's kind of an expensive process. So I don't like do it with real cheap bottles some of the some of the ones that mean a lot to me I will do but we tumble them would anybody ever tumble like rocks when they were a kid it's kind of the same principle as that there's a PCV pipe and it's got like prongs on one side of the holder and the other side has a point and it holds the bottle like this suspended in the PCV pipe then you fill it up with the copper to here, and you put the copper inside up to there. And we use a chemical called aluminum oxide. And it spins for seven days in this aluminum oxide and water solution with little copper pellets. What you're actually doing is wearing a layer of the glass off. And so the stain gets wore right off. The stain is usually caused by the lime that's in the ground, and it's actually etching right into the bottle. So it, it's, it's a tedious process, but for something that you want to keep around, or if, it was, if you were digging in your parents' yard or something and you found something that you knew belonged to them, you know, it's worth cleaning. No. No? And what would that little green bottle be used for? Spices or perfume or? Perfume. They, they use them for perfume, smelling salts. But the stopper, they had stoppers for beer bottles. They had them for apothecary bottles. They had them for medicine bottles. Um, they had, for about everything. Um, I know I have some for hair bottles, so, you know, for like hair coloring and stuff like that. This is a hair coloring bottle here. It's a walnut leaf hair restorer. And this is, this is from like the 1880s. Actually, it would probably add to the bottle a little bit because if you had a bottle like that, you know, it doesn't have as much appeal. You know, I don't, I don't really sell much. I've been single now for 15, 16 years. I have bottles in every room. <laughs> bathroom, I have a case in the bathroom. I'm wall to wall. <laughs> <clears throat> as soon as I got single, then before I had one room, then I expanded. I only have one room. He's, <laughs> he's not single. <laughs> this one I still haven't been able to find out about. Um, I dug it in Lake Orion. It's a Truman's Nursery Lotion. But I can't find, I really think I'm, uh, it's going to be English. And, but I, I haven't been able to track that down and I've had it for 10 years. That's part of the fun of the digging is researching the stuff. If 
finding out where it came from, who made it, how long it was around, you know, things like that. They didn't um, throw all the trash in there, so I wonder what made them now and then throw a bottle in. Well, if you think about it, they didn't have Thursday pickup. Yeah. <laughs> you know, nobody came to pick up their garbage. Uh, they didn't want to drive to the dump in the winter. Well, I grew up on a farm. We, we threw all ours in this building, and, it, and then, then we had to take a whole bay, and all of us, when I was a kid, all of us loaded onto the wagon so my dad takes it to the junkyard. And, but, and we had an outhouse until I was probably 11, um, and my dad put in uh, the, the bathroom and, and that. And um, uh, I don't believe we ever threw a bottle in. I mean, just really? People, I guess, well, we do dig some that are empty, but 95% of them have something in it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you also think they didn't want the kids getting into the broken glass. They didn't want the kids getting into the poison bottles. Mm -hmm. That's the safest place. Yeah. You know, that's the safest so place to throw it. Yeah. yeah, nobody's going to go in after them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Except me. Maybe it had some stuff in it, and that was where they dumped it, where they knew no animal could get to it, and then they just dropped the bottle in too. I mean, you know, into it too. Yeah, and I think that too. I think that's some of the reason where we would find whole dishes too, because you know it could have even been a slave. You know, they swiped something out of the refrigerator, headed out to the outhouse, ate it, destroyed the evidence, got rid of it. That's where Dad put the whiskey bottle, so Mama didn't catch them. <laughs> You know, so everybody's got a different reason why they think they ended up in the outhouse. I think a lot of it might have been winter dumping or just out of sight, out of mind. You know, I remember when we were little on the farm, we used to throw rocks at the bottles down in the hole. But uh, some of these holes, you might dig five or six bottles. I've dug them with 400 in the hole. I mean, just unbelievable. We did a yard, uh, Mrs. Golden, is that her name? Yeah. Oh, you would not believe the stuff that was in, in the, her yard. <clears throat> Crock jugs. There was about 18 different plates, pouring pitchers, candy dishes, and they were all in good shape. You know, it was amazing how much stuff was in her yard. Well, we wash them first, you know, and, and some of the bottles like this one, uh, this one, even this one, they come out of the ground just like that. <clears throat> A lot of your green glass comes out real clean. But uh, we just use like a coat hanger and uh, the little green scrubby pads. And we just cut little pieces off and you get right in there with a coat hanger. And no, we wash everything first, especially if I'm using it for a cereal bowl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> no, tumbling just is for the, to take the stain off. Hmm? You get many whiskey bottles? Yes. Yeah, you get you get quite a few and there's whiskey bottles have probably the biggest variety of different kinds. Um, let's jump to the whiskeys. These are actually whiskey bottles from the eighteen fifties. They're called historical flasks. And you could just tell they're much more intricate than you know, just a regular 1880s bottle is. <clears throat> These scroll flasks here, they're super common. I mean, in the 1850s, there's, we've dug hundreds of them. 99.9% .9 of them are broke, but that was a very, very commonly used whiskey bottle. See how you got the scar on the bottom? This one's called a Cornucopia Eagle Flask. And you can see the scar on the bottom. They come with uh, president's heads on them. Um, I have one that has 
a tree with no leaves on it on one side that says winter and the other side says summer with a tree with leaves on it. What's your favorite one? This is John. I dig with John and little Freddie here. But Pikes Peak. Yeah, there's one Pikes Peak that has a picture of the Pikes Peak guy right on it. A lot of them are Eagle Flasks, Jenny Lynn. You know, there's, there's a huge variety of the historical flasks that were the whiskey bottles. Then they got into just strap side flasks and plain flasks. You know, there's a lot of just plain ones out there that you could own a store and buy a gross of. I could buy a store and have a gross of them. You put your label on them, I put my label on them. But they were genetic and they were used all over. When did it go from clay to glass? Because is that a clay jug there? Yeah, clay was used in the 1850s and it was used in the 1900s. So, it, you know, clay was an option. It wasn't, you know, a necessity. <clears throat> this is a, a Dr. Cronk's. I actually found this when they were putting in the MGM casino. Um, I found it on the surface. The bulldozer just had turned it up and construction guys don't even pay attention. And whenever I see them doing that, I always look for sparkles of glass. And if I see it, I'll go out after they go home and look for stuff. And I found this. Now, Dr. Cronk made beer and he also made soda bottles. So this could have been a root beer or it could have been a beer. <clears throat> but this thing weighs a good pound and a half. Now fill it with beer. Can you imagine getting sent to the store to get a case of beer? You'd have to have an ox cart to bring it home, how heavy it is. <laughs> but your crack, here's some more. These are inkwells. <clears throat> this one right here, I've dug these in an 1850s pit. I dug the same ink in the 1900s pit. So they used them for all that period, they were still producing them in the 1900s. So these are like really hard to date. So if you dug a hole and that's all that was in them is these, you couldn't really tell what age you were at. You can't always date a hole by the china either because they could have used that china for 20 years before they threw it out. But a lot of the patterns have the names on the back, you can date them. But for it being in the privy, how long they use it first, you know, before it got thrown away or they broke it, you know, how long before they broke it and threw it away. <clears throat> this has a scar on the bottom. This is like as thin as an eggshell. It's called a puff pile. It took like one puff of air for the glass blower to make it. And we dig these without breaking them all the time. What are they used for? Everything. They would have just put a plastic, uh, paper label over the top. <clears throat> a lot of them were like that. Um, your drugstore bottles. Just like your plastic bottle, it could have been anything in there. They, you know, so it was just a plastic label or a paper label put over the outside. Part of the, part of this, the digging that's cool is the stories behind it. Um, my favorite thing, one of my favorite things I dug, we were digging in uh, Romeo. And I got into a lady's yard and she was super excited because we did the neighbor's yard and we dug tons of stuff. So we got into her yard. I found a little trash pit about that deep. I found a drugstore. Oh, I found a case gin bottle in there. And there was like two or three bottles. <clears throat> she was so excited. So I couldn't find the outhouse. So I went back up to the house and I said, sorry, I, you know, I can't find the outhouse. She goes, well, why not? 
I says, well, you got a basketball court going across the back of your, you know, house. I says, it's got to be under the basketball court. She says, well, can you tell? I says, well, yeah. I says, we'd have to put, you know, little three-quarter inch holes through the basketball court. You know, I says, I have a strong probe that would go through that. Okay. So we start poking holes in, in the basketball court. <clears throat> and what we do is we do lines like a grid pattern. We put 39 holes in our basketball court. I had about four more to do, and I hit it. And it was loaded. So I walked back up to the house. I banged on the door. I says, okay. I says, I found it. She says, okay. I says, it's under the basketball court. Can you dig it? I says, well, I says, that little three quarter inch hole, I says, it's going to be about three and a half by three and a half feet. You know, I says, we'd have to go through the concrete. Okay. I says, it's right under the basket. She goes, that's okay. So we ripped a hole in it. <clears throat> there was 200 bottles in the hole. Somebody had moved out in the 1880s, and the new owners came in and threw everything out that was in the house. There was whole stacks of plates that they threw the whole stacks in the privy. <clears throat> the ones on the outsides were broke. Four or five of them were still whole. In the very bottom of that hole, I dug a pouring pitcher about that big. It was 1820s redware. It was made in Maine. There wasn't a scratch on it. Salt glaze, it's, it, it was just beautiful. That was one of my favorite pieces of like uh, plates and stuff like that that I, that I ever dug. Then two days later, we went down the street, same, same block, got into a guy's backyard. We probed it all up, couldn't find one of the pits, the 1860s. We dug probably 60 bottles out of his yard. I angled under the driveway and I found it under the driveway. And he seen me when he was out there talking to us. I said, ah, I says, there it is, but it's too far in. Well, he says, I've been thinking about replacing that driveway anyway. I was amazed. We ripped a big hunk out of the driveway. You know, he says, go for it. And we dug about 50 bottles underneath that driveway. Funny part about it is it's still patched up today. He never, <laughs> he never did. He never did finish it. <clears throat> Same week. Across the street, the lady that had the pouring pitch in her yard, her brother-in-law wanted us to dig in his yard. I dug a redware jug out of his yard about this big, super intricate with cobalt blue, like lip prints all the way around the outside. Not a scratch on it. So some of the stories are amazing. Oh, I know one. Me and Tim were out digging over by Lake Orion. Tim, you tell them about it. Was that when, um, we were digging a well. No, we were mushroom hunting. Yep. We were out uh, morel mushroom hunting. And uh, we came across, we're out in the woods, and it was on like Bald Mountain Recreation Area. Close to the yeah. Okay. So we're walking around the woods, and we found a foundation while we were mor morel hunting. And uh, we uh, said, we're going to come back and probe around and see if we can find it. So we came back about a week later when our schedules permitted and we're probing around and we found a hole right away. Started digging <coughs> and uh, I mean it wasn't a foot down before we started coming up with bottles. And we were right there, it was 1890, 1900, 1910, it was ketchup bottles, remember? Mm -hmm. And it was one after another after another, it was Heinz ketchup, one after another after another, wasn't it? Whatever it was, it was ketchup. <laughs> and we get down to five, six foot, and we're still pulling up bottles and we're pulling up some milk bottles and nothing spectacular, but enough to keep our interest. We get down to about eight foot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm six foot three, and I should elaborate, but around five foot, 
we started hollowing it out and we found out that it was brick line. There was bricks stacked up all the way around. So we started hollowing it out and it was, it was arms across. We start getting down, get down, I get to about eight foot level and I'm, Tony, give me the probe. So he throws the probe down and I, I start probing. I still can't feel the bottom of the pit and I'm already eight foot down. I'm six foot three, so I'm, you know, like this. So Tony goes, all right, come on, get out of there, get out of there. Let me at it, let me at it, you know. And I'm like, all right. So I said, let, let me get out. But I put my hands up on top of the, uh, the hole here and I don't like going above my head. I mean, we've had cave-ins before where, I mean, he's been up to his chest. I've been to here, you know, I'm a big man, you know, it's a little weird when you gotta, you know, dig yourself out. But uh, he says, let me in. I put my hands up here, I put my foot against the brick and I push up with this foot. And as I push up and I told him, I says, this feels really spongy. And he goes, because maybe there's garbage or something down there. I push up and the floor drops out from underneath me. Oh. And when I say drops out, I mean, it was like, you know, like 25 you feet the, down. You see in the oh. movies, oh. you see in the movies. And I'm hanging like this. And, you know, thank God this was 15 years ago because, you know, it was now I'd be in the bottom of that hole. But, um, and he, he reaches over, tries to, he's like, come on, let me help you up. I'm like, get out of here before I pull you down, you know? And, you know, I, I got out. But we, um, we ended up calling the city, remember? And we, yeah. There was, there was a bunch of trash around there. We dumped a water heater down there. And, Washer. Oh, and yeah. And we actually went as far as, you know, Spray, spray paint the sign, yeah, and we stuck it in there. And it was like that for years before you know yep. something happened about it. But yeah, it was pretty scary. And now there's condos on top of it. Yeah. Oh. They, they built so what we figured out, area. it was a well. You know, it was a well, and uh, it was scary. We got a few scary. You know, that was scary. But Tony and I used to go to Saginaw, downtown Saginaw, and uh, that's when we would like dig in groups. And Saginaw was easy because we had the plat maps, and it was dated what 1840? 70s, yeah, 1870s. Uh, I'm sorry, 1870s were the maps, and you know most of the houses were like burned out, you know, and the ones that were occupied were a little dicey, you know. So you know, I, I was a worker for the police department at the time, so as I had a sidearm tucked in my back pocket, and uh, I'd be down at the bottom of the hole, and we'd start digging early in the morning, and then you know some of the neighborhood people, you know, would come around, and it was. Crazy. And there was a couple of times where we just had a, we. I looked at him. I go, time to bail. You know, time to leave. You know, people come over and go, what are you trying to do? Get paid? You know, and they were like, oh no no, we're just you know here for history buffs and history buffs and you know we had a few indecent proposals from a few people. <laughs> yeah, some some, yeah. Of, some of the areas that we dug at were really shady areas. Yeah. Uh, I know in Battle Creek it was real bad. We were digging in one house and. Um, we were getting tons of bottles, and about 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden it was like a steady line of people going to the apartment upstairs. It was like one after another after another. We're digging, this. I dug this one in that hole. We're digging good stuff out of this yard. And probably about 12 o'clock, we figured out the way people were coming down the stairs, they were all messed up and it was a crack house that we were digging behind and one guy came down and actually threw a shovel at us and then passed out in the bushes and so we we got out of there we you know we walked up to it the house is half burned out it's half burned out i mean we're literally it caught on fire and there was a couple of blue tar blue tarps over the top of it and they're flapping in the wind and i'm like oh okay it's abandoned you know, so we start digging in the back, and all of a sudden, get out of my yard. I'm like, oh, okay. You know? Yeah, so some of the areas were really shady. I mean, there was other areas. I remember uh, I was in Lapeer, and I had my map, and we were trying to figure out the lot lines. So I was walking down an alley that wasn't there no more. And I'm walking down, and I'm figuring out, okay, this one lines up with this one, and this one's 32 feet, then 32, and I'm pacing it off. I come out from that alley and there was 12 cops with shotguns on the roofs. Whoa, <laughs> you know, I dropped right down. They came out, what are you doing? And I explained it to them and they ended up hanging out and watching us dig the holes. They were totally fascinated with it. They did that in Detroit also, you know, so it was, there's so many stories behind some of the digs that we've done that, that were just amazing. And a lot of the places we dug at, they're gone. You know, they're covered up with car washes and parking lots and, you know, they're, they're covered up forever. There's a know. story about when we were down in Port Huron and there was an old fort down there that dated, 
you know, like 18, 20. Yeah. And there was a, you know. Sport grass. Yeah. There was a piece of fence that was knocked over. And we were like, hmm, I don't see any tread, no trespassing signs. And go over there and put a shovel on the ground. And then all of a sudden there's a border patrol and, you know, a bunch of other federal agents. And what are you boys doing? You're on federal property. Hey, well, I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry, yeah. like the block next to it, I got permission. That it was owned by, um, uh, it used to be the Edison Inn that was out there. So I got permission for a whole block there. And I dug next to the fort a whole block and dug lots of nice stuff out of there. I actually dug a USA Hospital Department bottle. And those were only used in the forts. And they were used for everything from penicillin to pesticides. And Thomas Edison then sold to Hilton. Hilton sold a section of it to Bally's College. And Bally's put up a, a school right smack dab on the top of Fort Gratiot. And I tried everything in my powers to stop them. There was Indian mounds there. When they were bulldozing, there was soldiers, buttons, and it was a historic site. I went to everybody trying to stop them. I went to the Indians. I went to the historical societies of Michigan. Nothing could stop them. You know, it's, it's all money. It's all a money-oriented thing. And now I can't even go by there anymore because it just makes me sick what they covered up there. <clears throat> there was actually a roll of bob wire wrapped around one of the trees <coughs> that was bob wire from the 1860s. And it was from the fort there. And that's, it's all gone. I mean, they totally covered everything up. They wrecked it. So a lot of the, a lot of the stuff is gone forever, you know. Uh, we used to be able to dig on state lands, and now you can't, you can't go on state land. You can't metal detect on state land. Uh, you can get a permit to like go on the beach and metal detect. You gotta pay for the permit and you gotta give them everything you find. You know, even, even in the water, uh, outside of the state parks and stuff, you're, you're not allowed to do nothing out there anymore. So now pretty much we just, we're banging on doors and that's how we get our permissions. Um, do you find any poison bottles? Yeah. I noticed, isn't that one, the blue one laying down? Yeah, you can, if you see on the outside of this bottle, you can see there's a bunch of little dots on the outside of it. The reason that they did that they're called hobnails, is what they're called. <clears throat> Back in the day, everything was kerosene lamps. So if, if it was nighttime and you went up into the medicine cabinet to get some cough syrup, and you felt them little hobnails, you'd know that's poison, you can't take that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of your poison bottles have them hobnails on it. This one actually says poison not to be taken right on it. <clears throat> a lot of your other poison bottles, that don't have the hobnails were triangular shaped. And so that would tell you that it's a poison too. This one's actually got a fly on it. It was like for killing flies. But yeah, you, you, dig, you dig some poison bottles. Um, I've even dug a couple embalming fluids. You know, you wonder why, because it wasn't like behind a funeral home. I don't know what they were doing with it. But we've dug a couple, one of them I dug was really a nice one, real fancy one from Grand Rapids. It was dated 1863 on it. <clears throat> Anybody got any ideas on what this might be? Were those ink? Nope. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, they call them pepper sauces. Uh, could have been A1 steak sauce or a chili sauce or something on that order. The little indents here are to represent like stained glass windows. And they call these cathedral pepper sauces to like church windows that are in them. <clears throat> this one has a scar on it too, so it's 1850s. They come in a lot of wild colors too. There's, there's real dark green ones and some amber ones that are real pretty too. This is a wine bottle, American Vintage, New York. Most of your wine bottles didn't have writing on them. This one's pretty rare because of the writing that's on, on it. And this one's like 1860s. 
<coughs> There's a lot of them that are shaped like that without writing. They call them hock wines. Some of them are like big. I think there's one in the, I, I have in the display that they have in there right now, there's a hock wine in there that I dug. All the bottles that are in that display right now, I dug. Any ideas? What is it, Freddie? Oh, it's just dumb. It's in my nose. What is it? Um, Dr. Sykes shirk here? Nope. Oh. Um, it's a pop bottle. Uh, this is called a Hutchinson soda. This is like 1890s, 1900. <clears throat> they got a little glass, a uh, little wire thing inside here, and that's how they used to seal them. And then you would hit it down, and that's how it would open. <clears throat> now, I've been giving these speeches now for about 20 years. And I've been telling people wrong on something for about 20 years. <laughs> I always thought and was told, <clears throat> back in the day, everything was called soda. I mean, in Boston, they still call pop soda. I was informed when I was young that when they used to hit these down, it would make a pop sound. And that's how they come up with the word pop. And so for all these speeches I've been given, I've been telling people that that's how they come up with the word pop. Well, about four years ago, five years ago, this is also a pop bottle, but this one's like from the 1860s. And uh, on the back of it, it says pop. <laughs> so that kind of blew my theory with, with the, the pop sound coming out of the thing here. So obviously they must have called it pop much sooner than that. So them old timers taught me wrong. <laughs> but this one here is a pop bottle. And this one's like 1860s, 1870s. <clears throat> this is another one. It's from New York. But that one you can see has the iron panel on the bottom. So that one's like 1850s, 1860s at the latest. Any ideas on that? It's a shoe polish from the 1880s. It's called Bixby's, and Bixby's also made ink too. So they made shoe polishes, inks, stove blackening, and things like that. Very big company. <coughs> In the, in the 1890s, we used to dig a lot of bottles. Well, any time before the 1890s, a lot of the bottles would say cure on them. Uh, this one's a Sanford's Radical Cure. In the 1890s, they made it illegal to use that word cure. And they had to change all their bottles to remedies. Um, because nothing was really a cure. So they really cracked down on that. So if you are digging in a hole and you're finding the cures, you know you're pre-1890s. <clears throat> some of the names that are on the bottles too are crazy. I mean, some of the stuff that, that you see, I got one that's a uh, Ganter's Magic Chicken Cholera Cure. You know, there's, I have one from the 1860s that's a, a syphilis cure, you know, from the 1860s. Um, just, a, just amazing stuff. This is your basic water in a bottle, just like you get today. This was a mineral water bottle, Saratoga, New York. Uh, this one's like 1880s, right around in there. Most of them come in that color, or ambers. So what's the oldest you've dug up? <clears throat> I have a picture of it in the thing here. It's a crock vessel. It's about this big around. It has two gargoyle faces on each side. It's got a top on it that, that, that was broke, but it was... Um, 
It was a liquid potpourri container. And it was mid 1700s. And it was brought from Persia or Greece is what I was told. <clears throat> That's the oldest thing I dug. Um, 1820s, 1830s, I might have a couple pieces from that era, but that's about as old as you're going to get. I've only dug in Michigan. Uh, I really haven't gone anywhere else because Michigan's clay, and it's really hard to dig in the clay. It's hard to find the pits. So there's nothing really dug in, in this area. So I figured out how to find them in the clay, so I pretty much stick right to here. <clears throat> you can go out east, and you know it's a lot older out there. But by the time I go out there, I spend a couple days researching, a couple days getting permission. It might have been an area that somebody's already dug. You know, it's. It would. I could waste a lot of money going to a spot and not finding nothing there because it's already been you know messed with from there. That's why I stay in Michigan where I know there's nothing right here that's really been dug. <clears throat> Is your oldest piece glass or, or clay? The oldest piece was clay. Clay, yeah, pottery. But I've dug quite a few, 18, probably 1830s, 40s, 50s. We did quite a few from that era. That's the stuff we really look for. Very hard to find in Michigan, but we treasure it. And, and I'm, now that I'm single, I'm terrible. I, I bring home the broken bottles. <laughs> Um, some of the like fancy colors, I cut the pieces, I have a bunch of them, and I clean them in my machine. I'm going to make stained glass lamps with them. Uh, some of the fancy beer bottles, like if I dug this one and the top was broke off here, I cut it off here and I make drinking glasses. Uh, some of the dishes that are flow blue and stuff, <clears throat> I'm going to make mosaic tables with. You know, this is all stuff I, I recently retired and I'm starting to work on some of these projects now, but I got buckets and shards and I got so <laughs> lots of stuff. He does because I've moved him about six times. <laughs> yeah. Along Last with, time though, I'm home and boy now. Along with, you know, 10, <clears throat> 15 foot cases that weigh 500 pounds. <laughs> yeah, that's my mover. Okay. If you're digging on uh, a person's property, do you negotiate with them what you can have and what they I have? usually tell them that we split 50-50. Okay. Um, I've been doing this for 36 years. 85% of the stuff that we dig, I, I got it. You don't really want it. You know, no, I, I already have it. Oh, okay. So I, we leave 90% of the stuff with the homeowner, oh. you know, or else if they don't want it, like a lot of stuff's gone to the Clarkston Historical Society when we dig here in Clarkston. I'm just after something I don't have, you know, or something unusual, something like that. But most of the stuff we leave with the homeowner. <clears throat> this is a citrate bottle. It's from the 1870s. Everybody probably loves the color, right? This bottle's actually clear. It was messed with to make it this color. So if you find bottles that are this color, they actually irradiated them with radioactive. They use like, uh, like what they do to, to raise chicken eggs. You know how they, they keep them in the incubator type things? That will change the glass into this purple color and they fool a lot of people. I mean, with this bottle, <clears throat> it's worth like five bucks. With it purple, they might get 25 bucks out of it, but they're really fooling the person because it actually hurts the value of the bottle. It wrecks it. it, it just totally wrecks it. So if you see bottles like this in the antique stores, just stay away from it. They're, they're fake, they're, they're no good. I mean, it's an old bottle and everything, but they totally smashed the value and everything with it because of the purple that's in there. Are they reading it now to change the color? Yes. Oh, okay, because that's what they're doing with gemstones, to raise the <coughs> value of the gemstone. So what they've done is they take the Does it actually raise the value of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah those, all those strawberry diamonds you see, they're all irradiated, or the chocolate diamonds. Mm -hmm. So they've taken a plain white bottle, 
and they ra radiated it, and now it's this, and they're doing it now to these old bottles. Is yeah. Yeah, okay. and they are. They do have one other color too, but I don't have one. Um, it's kind of a kind of a chocolatey color, um, but they're they're radiating them. And what it is is, if they radiate an aqua bottle, it's coming out that chocolate color. Oh. But it totally wrecks it. And even like on eBay and stuff, people are really getting buffaloed by it. You know, they're paying big money because they think it's a fancy color, and you know it's not. <clears throat> the magnesium in glass that gets left in the sunlight. Well, That's a different story altogether. I usually bring one and I didn't bring one. I don't know if there's one in here. I, I don't try to do it in cataracts. I do it or it also up to Yeah, a lot of these drug stores have that magnesium in them. Yeah. Now that's different. If that turns purple, yeah. it's not as bold. No. It's, it's really more of a pale lavender type color. That's acceptable, that's good. Those are actually good. But color is very, very important yeah. in your values. Yeah. <clears throat> this is your basic amber. All right, this, this bottle would probably sell for like $80. If it was this color, it'd sell for 8,000. You know, so color means a lot you know, in, in the pricing of it, depending on what the bottle is. Would the colors in the older bottle be more expensive? For example, if I were 1830 and I wanted a bottle and I, I was buying something special, would the blue color be more expensive for me than a... I don't believe so, no. No, I don't think so. Do you, do you think they were? I don't think they were. It's all subjective. Who wants to pay what for it? Yeah. Yeah. Say what? What, what bottle are you talking about? Yeah. And you did that bottle. You no, she means if you were an ink producer. Oh, for ink producer? And he was buying a lot of bottles. Would they be more for a color yeah, bottle? Yeah, the bottle was more because they had to add it. Like, uh, if you wanted to make a bottle red, which was very uncommon, it was either gold or copper that you had to add to the glass to get the red color. Um, That's why you don't see no red, because they had to use real gold to make red. Your normal color was aqua, so that was your cheapest. No addition to the glass mixture at all. It's just boom, that's what you got. Well, look at all your ink bottles then, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were buying your ink, would it matter what bottle? Or does the ink, with, they're usually black ink or brown, right? Red, blue. In the 1890s? Oh, yeah. Sure. So would it matter what color bottle I bought? Or would they, do you think they'd be all the same price? Or I, I think they were probably the same price. Okay. I think if, if you bought an umbrella ink and it was aqua or it was this color, it still cost you $1.50 or whatever it would cost at the time. Okay. <clears throat> Any ideas on what this one might be? What is it, Freddie? It's a baby nurser. That's exactly right. This is that. This was a baby feeder. It actually says the oval feeder right on the front here. And that one's like 1890s, 1900. This is a snuff. These. They get really fancy when you get back into the really, really early ones. This one's like 1900s, but some of the ones from the 1840s and stuff are just gorgeous. They're beautiful. <coughs> we already talked about the Maggie bottle. Inks. Tony, excuse me. Do you remember I showed you a bottle at my house that was almost shaped like a lemon, and it didn't stand up. It had to lay down. And I think you told me it was a ballast bottle. <laughs> Used for ballast in ships. Oh, it was a round bottom pop, pop bottle that wouldn't stand up, right? It was sort of shaped like a lemon almost. Could yeah, torpedo soda, up. that's called. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, and they did that for something for with the shipping, to lay it on its side so that the corks would stay wet while they were shipping them so that they didn't pop the corks on long trips like from overseas because a lot of those are English. Oh, okay. Right. But yeah, that was a soda bottle. Okay. Inks are kind of my baby. I love ink bottles. I probably have 300 different kinds of ink bottles. 
Um, they're just my favorite. This one here is called a Koning. It has the scar on the bottom, so it's like 1850s. This is a Koning, what it turned into. These are like 1890s, 1900s. So this was what your earlier one was, and as they improved, they turned into this one. Now I have probably 30 different colors of this one. They came in all different colors. Is that one a very common color? I've never seen glass that common. This one here? No, the green. No, it's actually, that's a pretty rare color. Yeah. Your common color would be this. <clears throat> you could dig 50 of these in aqua before you're going to get a color one. These, most of them were color. There's a few of them that are aqua, but they, they use more color back in the day. You know, back in the old and 1850s and stuff, they came up with a lot more colored stuff, I think, than they had now. <clears throat> the white one is milk glass. No, no, this is, this is 1870s, 1880s. Um, it's got doors and windows. Uh, it's, it's called a schoolhouse ink, and it's to represent a schoolhouse. They come in aqua too, but they don't come in too many colors. They're, they're mostly aqua and milk glass. This one with the offset neck is called the turtle ink. It kind of looks like a turtle, but... And that's like 1860s to 1880s, right in that era there. The stoneware ones, that, like I told you before, they, they use these for 50, 60 years. So it's really hard to date what those are. <clears throat> this is a Stafford's ink. It was a very big name in ink for many, many, many years. Like that one and this one, they were just called uh, like spool inks is what they call them. This one here is kind of unusual. It's got the indents all the way around. It's actually where they used to rest the pen. So these are called pen rest inks. <clears throat> this one has a hole in the top. Wouldn't spill. It's real kind of heavy. Uh, 1900s is called a funnel ink. It kind of looks like a funnel on the top. This is an umbrella ink. Um, it's got the scar on the bottom. They, they come up until probably 1880. They kind of phased them out and they didn't, they didn't have them much after the 1880s. These are my babies. I mean, I, even, I go out and search for these. I buy them. I, they're like one of my favorites. I have 50 different <coughs> colors of these. Start off in Boyne City. Where were the first areas you looked at? What was your first memorable finds? Well, we, we were doing the logging camps. Um, my first bottle was a Hills Humane Oil, and it's, it's a super common bottle. Um, some of the Boyne City drugstores. My first really good bottle was in Harbor Springs and it was a citrate of magnesia. Um, everybody always asks me what my favorite is. That's kind of tough to tell you because there's just too many. Uh, I've dug some really weird things along the way. I have, uh, I have a little doll. It's in a glass tube. It's sealed. It's full of water. And has a porcelain doll about that big from the 1860s inside the tube. I've had that for 20 years, still don't know exactly what it was for. I have no idea. I have a picture up in the photo album if you'd like to see that. Um, <clears throat> I dug a pillar. It's about this tall. It has a picture of Abe Lincoln on two sides and his wife Mary Todd on two sides. It has Lincoln without a beard. So it was pre-presidential, 
And from what I was told, it was probably used for his presidential campaign. He had something on the top, it's broke off. I don't know what was on the top. I have pictures of that too. Um, once you get up in here, you'll see I have marbles, dentures, um, buttons, silver spoons, eyeglasses, toothbrushes. Uh, I have a gun here. I was digging in Milford and we were digging behind a nun's parsonage and they, they had a gun in their outhouse and it was all nuns that lived there. So one of them nuns had a little gun under her little black <laughs> robe there. You know, so that was very interesting. Here's, here's an interesting piece. Anybody got any idea what that is? Oh, that looks like an inhaler. Nope. What's it for your ears? Breast pump. Exactly. It's a breast pump from the 1850s. <clears throat> I dug that in, um, in Detroit. We were driving around and it was parking lot. And there was a three foot strip of glass in the back of the parking lot. And we hit the privies in the back of the parking lot. You know, it's, that's part of what's so cool about this is I dug this in Saginaw, I dug this in Romeo, I dug this in Battle Creek, I dug this in Niles, I dug this in Battle Creek. This is a master ink, I didn't tell you about that, but that's what they filled the little ones with, big ones like this, Saginaw. <clears throat> There's stories behind where I dig all these things. You know, it's, it's what makes it so fun. You know, it's just been a great hobby. I'm probably one of the most loyal privy diggers that are out there. I'm not just saying, but how many people do you know that's got an outhouse on their arm? <laughs> <laughs> you probably never see another person with an outhouse. Does anybody have any questions? This was wonderful. In, in your display, do you, do you organize it by like inkwells, whiskey bottles, poison bottles, and do you label it all? Because these are all your babies. Who's going to know what these are? Um, a lot of people would know <laughs> what they are. I mean, John would know. John's been digging with me for years. Uh, <clears throat> Sometimes I do them by my Michigan case. Uh, that's all Michigan bottles. My inks, yes, they're all my inks. Mm -hmm. I have five display cases of inks. Um, some are by age. You know, so yeah, yeah, they're separated. They're not just all thrown up like this is. This takes me a while to put together because this is coming from here, this is coming from there. But uh, a lot of it's by age, more by age. Okay. And I'm not as healthy as I used to be, so I'm not digging as much. I love to teach people. Little Freddie was at one of my speeches, what, about three years ago, four years ago? <clears throat> he sat right on the end of the chair like that. He came up after the speech and had a bunch of broken pieces that he screened out of his garden. He flipped me right out. I couldn't believe that. He wanted to learn how to dig. I've taken him out now. We've dug probably eight privies together now, you know, and he's catching right on. So I really love to teach people how to do it. I have another guy that's 20 that I'm digging with now, too. So I love to pass it on. That and they can move the dirt away. <clears throat> yes. I point, they dig. <laughs> you know, so that helps a lot. I have a 14 year old that loves digging too, whether he loves it or not. <laughs> have you ever dug in Bayview up in uh, Petoskey? Have you ever dug in the cottage area of Bayview? See, when I lived up, up north, it was all vacant lots we did. We never heard of this banging on doors. We were kind of scared of that. Then I moved downstate, and it turned into nothing but banging on doors. Now, I just recently moved back up last August. Uh, I'm retired up there now. 
and we're just starting to bang on doors up there. Um, last Sunday, I, I got my first permission in East Jordan banging on doors. Mm -hmm. So Bayview's on our list, but Bayview, you're 1900, 1910. 187. Not a lot of them though, you know. But yeah, we're, we're gonna be in Bayview and there's really, there's no room in their backyards to put them privy. So I don't think they'd be really hard to find, but I'm concentrating right now, Petoskey, Boynton City and East Jordan. You know, but yeah, I could pop into Bayview, especially if you know somebody that has a house. They do. I got my cards here. So Cross you could grab Village. one of my cards and yeah, in Cross Village we're aiming at too. You know, I'm gonna give a talk up there in Cross Village. We've already contacted the Historical Society. <clears throat> and I do a lot of other things. I, for probably eight years now uh, in Milford, we do their home tour to where they're going through all the old homes and we're behind one of them digging the outhouse. You know, so it, and it's really been beneficial for them and us because they sell a lot more tickets. There's people now that come just to watch us dig. You know, so I do that and I've probably given 56 speeches now. Um, Clarkston last year did their very first one. It was a huge success. It was all a last minute deal. Uh, we actually dug in Polly's yard, but we did a public dig. And it cost five bucks that went to the Historical Society and they could come and watch us all day digging holes. And we opened up a couple holes in Polly's yard and we had another yard that we dug too. So that's, I really love doing that, sharing what I do, you know, and teaching the kids. I just love teaching the kids. Freddie's turned it to be quite a big digger, and he's hooked. He'll be, do it, he'll be doing it for 30, 40 years. There ain't a doubt in my mind. And he'll help pass on, you know, what I've taught him. So. That's very cool. Any other questions? Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thanks.